Father, we thank you, Lord, uh, for this morning. We do pray, God, that you would just uh, speak to our hearts. Um, again, God, we just give this all to you, Father, and we ask, God, that you'd be glorified in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Revelation, but I do want to do a, a, um, a little review uh, just to bring things up to our mind. Remember, we talked about what the book of Revelation is, or rather, who it's about, and we saw that the Revelation is about Jesus Christ. It's an apocalypse of Jesus Christ, and we need to always remember that it's going to be a revelation of Jesus Christ and who he is. And we saw in chapter 1 that this unveiling of Jesus Christ and what he's going to be unveiled to is Jesus Christ, we saw, as a risen, glorified Christ. He holds the stars in his seven hands, the messengers, and he walks among the seven churches. And actually, it was said in chapter 1, verse 19, is the table of contents. He says, write those things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will come. And so we saw that in chapter 1, the things we are to write about, the things which you have seen. And so we saw in chapter 1, the glorified Christ, and he's walking among the seven churches. And that's what John actually saw, and he started writing, and we went through that whole study of the glorified Christ and what that all represents. We then saw, write the things which are. And so the things which are was in chapter 2 and chapter 3, and that is the glorified Christ and how he writes seven letters to seven churches, right? In Turkey, in Asia Minor. And in that, he wrote four specific aspects we saw to each one of these letters. Each one of these letters had a local emphasis. In other words, there was a place called Ephesus. There was a place called Smyrna and Pergamos and Thyatira and Sardis, right? We know that. We went to those actual areas. We saw the ruins. So there was a local application to those churches in the day. But we saw that every single letter actually ended with what, what the Spirit says to the churches. And so there's an ecclesiastical, which means church perspective. So we, as Calvary Chapel, listen to what the church said to them, and we said, well, how are we in those areas? Are we, are we doing those areas? Have we left our first love? We always need to look at those different areas and, and respond. We saw there was always a personal application, he who has an ear, and we need to realize that those that got some of the best part of, of looking through the first two, three chapters is that there's a personal application of what God was speaking to those people about, and he speaks to us about today. And then we ended by talking about the historic prophetic application, how <clears throat> each one of those churches represents a period of time throughout church age history. And we did a, a couple of weeks talking about that. So if you've missed any of those, you want to find out what they were about, that's really good that we do. Then we said that write those things which will take place after this. After what? After chapters 2 and 3. After the church age. And so we saw the first thing that would happen is chapter 4 says, after this, and then John was immediately caught up into the heavens, and we talked about the rapture. We talked about the rapture of the church, and the church is now in the throne room of God as we start chapter 4. In chapter 4, we saw this incredible <clears throat> aspect of what the throne room of God is going to look like. <clears throat> we see that the throne room of God has these colors of jasper and sardius, these voices and thunders and, and lightning coming from the throne of God. We saw that before the throne of God, we had these seven uh, lamps that, that represent the seven spirits of God or the Holy Spirit. We saw also that we had 24 thrones around the throne of God. And encircling the throne of God was this emerald rainbow talking about God's keeping his promises to us. But these 24 thrones had 24 elders with 24 crowns on them, and they were clothed in white garments. And we talked about that representing the church. And so we're leaving that, and we are now going, <clears throat> excuse me, there was also these four incredible living creatures in front of them, right? They had eyes inside and out, all around. And they had these, these heads that had these four different dimensions on them, of an eagle, of a man, of a lion, and an ox. And these, these creatures glorified God day and night. They never stopped. And when they, after they did it, then what? The 24 elders fell down, right? And they worshiped. We followed their lead of the worship of, the, of, these, of these four living beasts. So now we're going to go into chapter 5, if you want to open your Bible to chapter 5. And in chapter 5, it still starts with somewhat about the throne of God. But then we're going to find that it's going to change. We're going to move from the throne of God to what is being held in he who sits on the throne of God, which is a scroll. 
So this morning we're going to talk about the Lamb taking the scroll, and we're going to talk about something called the Kinsman Redeemer, and how the Lamb uh, takes the scroll and what that scroll actually represents. So let's go ahead and read through all 14 verses, and we'll come back and we'll talk about the first eight, <clears throat> first seven. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look at it. So this is John. I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to even look at it. But then one of the elders, one of the 24 elders, said to John, said to me, don't weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the sp seven spirits of God sent out to all the earth. And he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him <clears throat> um, who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and open the seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. The living creatures and the elders and a number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, excuse me, and many angels around the thrones the number of them ten thousands times ten thousands and thousands and thousands. They started saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to re receive power and riches and wisdom, strength and honor and glory and blessings. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such are in the sea and all that are, are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. What an incredible thing we're, we're witnessing through John writing this down and pinning this down for us about what's actually happening in heaven. We see it starting. Really, I see four things happening. We see the Father sitting there, and he has a scroll, and he's holding the scroll, and the scroll we see has seven seals on it. But then there's, there's a problem that exists momentarily in heaven. There is no one who's worthy enough. Someone had to be found worthy enough to come and to take this scroll to open the seven seals and then what? Read it. But there is no one found worthy. And we see this huge dilemma to the point where John starts to cry, weeping as he's there witnessing them. But then the problem solved because someone from the line of the tri tribe of Judah right? The root of David is now worthy. And that lamb who was slain comes forth, takes the scroll out of the father's hand. That's what we saw. Once that happened, what? Total praise erupted in heaven. And we have three different praise songs. And we're going to talk about worship next week because there's a connection between the word of worthy and worship. But that's next week's study as we look at the five songs in the one song in chapter seven of worship. So let's go back to chapter, verse 1. And I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with the seven seals. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Please note that the scroll there is written on the inside and the back. So by looking at it, there's something written on the back side of it. It's sealed, it's not opened. So there's different types of seals. We're going to talk about that excuse me, different types of scrolls. There are some scrolls that are open and some scrolls that are sealed. This was a sealed scroll, and it was sealed with seven scrolls. Now, scrolls were written either in velum, which is a goatskin, or papyrus, but most of them are written in papyrus. 
And papyrus is made from this plant that we're going to see here. It's called a, a papyrus plant, and it actually grows. And the way they make papyrus, and we've actually seen this done. When Angela and I went to uh, Turkey, we saw them actually do this in front of us. They take this papyrus plant, and they actually cut strips of it, real thin, thin strips of it. And they can roll it out and press it, and they'll soak it, and roll it out and press it. And it has a natural starch, a natural gumminess on it. Sometimes they may roll one all vertically and then horizontally. Sometimes they intermix them, vertical, horizontal, vertical, horizontal, and they might weave one inside of it. And they make this little, uh, this little cloth thing about that big, or how big the papyrus really is, is the size that they can make it. And then they'll roll it and they will press it. And the rolling and the pressing of it, it causes it to flatten out, become like a thick piece of paper. But it causes the glues to intermix and become dry. And they let it dry for about six days in one location. They put it under cloth. Six days in another, we actually got a piece of papyrus paper with something written on, written on it. And so that was, was, was actually used. But then they would actually take one to the next slide, and it shows you some actual um, uh, strips there. I don't know why the St. Jean Church is up there. But they show them laying them out. And then when they get done, they're real dry there, down there at the end. Can I see the next slide? Well, what happened then is they would then take them and they would, if it was pretty long, they would attach them together and make a long, 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 long scroll with them. Now, I want you to notice the different sizes. If I just made one papyrus page, it might be, depending on the size of the papyrus, that big, right? Some books in the Bible like Jude, 2 John, 3 John, the small letters, right, the small epistles, they're on one papyrus page. Other ones have several papyruses paid that they have attached. Now, when they write, if you notice, they're in three-inch columns, and they're going to write down here, and they're going to write down here, and they're going to write down here. I'm not done. I'm going to add another piece of papyrus, right? And I'm going to what? Continue to write down here, continue to write down here, continue to write down here. I need another sheet, just like you would different sheets of paper, right? But they'd take the paper, and then they would attach them, and then they would roll them up into a what? A scroll. So the scroll is not read this way. Hear ye, hear ye. The scroll is read what? This way, from left to right. But the, depending on the language, it's written in, the language might go from right to left, but the columns will go down because you go from one page to the next page to the next page. Thus, when you see them on the very bottom, you see they sit and they what? They roll it in this direction as they read through it. Does that make sense? So that's how the scrolls are actually written. <clears throat> I've seen some, some uh, uh, clips on how they can actually take a scroll now through the different, um, I don't know how they do it, infrared or whatever, imaging, they can have not even open it and tell you exactly what the scroll is by doing one layer over the next layer or the next layer and actually tell you before even they unroll it because sometimes when they unroll it, it might destroy it because they're so old and ancient. So I just thought that was really pretty, pretty cool. <clears throat> Again, it wasn't common to write a scroll on front and back. They'd write on one page. So normally if there was something they wanted to write on it, either it was too much information, they'd continue to write over, or if it was a sealed scroll, they might write the instructions of what a person has to follow in, over in order to be able to open the scrolls. Does that make sense? And they'd write that on the outside. Now, that's really pertinent because I'll be talking about something and how that might come together. And so um, what they would do is they would take sealing wax. Some of you guys know what sealing wax is. Some of you guys know? Hit the next one. So sealing wax is a, a kind of wax, and you would, if you'd heat up some wax, some of you might do this, and you might pour a little bit of wax on some envelope. You might take a penny, right? If you pushed a penny in the imprint of the pant, you'd have a, a reverse side of, of Abraham Lincoln, right? Looking whatever the opposite way he's looking. Does that make sense? Because they'd put in the imprint. Well, what they would do is each person might have a signet ring that might have a stamp declaring who they were back in those days. And they would send a message. And the message is sent. If it's from someone, oh, it's from me. And they would push the wax and that would then seal it closed. If a person tried to peek into it, it would break the what? Bad, bad. You don't want to peek into a letter. And you can't just go like some people do, and you know when they heat it up and they reseal it. You can't do that because you broke the seal, which was a ring, and you could no longer do that. And you'd also know by looking at the seal the authority of the person who is sending this special scroll. So I thought that was, that was pretty important for us to understand back in those days. So here are a bunch of different 
seals, and these are actually different seals of different seals that were made from different um, people, mainly from their rings, or they may have had a press, but a lot of them was from the rings that they would press and they were authority. So if somebody ever gave you the ring to send a note out, they are also giving you with them what? Authority to do that with it too. So um, we know that seven is a number of perfections or, or completions. So this was a complete scroll of what God would want to share with us. Hit the next slide here. Now the scrolls were sealed um, in, in a couple different ways. And I really do not know. I think I might like this way better, but I don't know if it's really the real way. I mean, I could say, Brad, what do you think is the real way? I really don't know. But a lot of them, they take the scroll and they would roll it up and then they would put a string around it and then they would seal it and seal it and seal it and seal it and seal it to the page, seal it to the page, so the string and it is all sealed to the page at one time. The bottom one has it sealed in the string. Um, I think the top left would seal them both together and so you would, you would have to break it in order to, to ever get to it. You could see that it was not done. But you'd have to, in order to read those scrolls, you'd have to open all seven seals, correct? before you'd ever be able to open the scroll. There are people that believe this is how this scroll was sealed. This is pertinent because when we hit the seven seal judgments, have you heard that? It's because these seals are being what? Broken. And he broke the first seal in chapter 6. And he broke the second seal. These are the seals he's talking about they're breaking when they're opening to find out what's going to be read. There's another perspective. Hit the next slide. The other perspective is this, that the pages were a little bit somewhat off-centered. So in, I might do one page, and then when I'm done with it, when I rolled it up, I could actually seal just that one page and then continue writing, then seal that second page, continue writing, seal the third page. Does that make sense? So if I just broke off one seal, I could then read the contents but I'd have to break off the what? Second seal to continue to what? Read. Some people believe very strongly that this is how the scroll was sealed. I don't know. But I just want to give you the, the perspective of both of those because I think that they're, that they're really important to understand. If we look in chapter, verse 2 and verse 3, it says, I saw a strong angel, some people believe this might have been an archangel, uh, proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose the seals? No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. Do notice, the authority that somebody had to open the scroll means that there has to be worthiness. This person had to be worthy in order to be able to open the scrolls. We have a dilemma because it says when they looked in heaven and on earth and under the earth, no one was found worthy to open the scroll. Now this creates a dilemma. Here's a father holding the scroll and they're looking around for someone to take it and no one's able to take the scroll. He wants them to take the scroll, but no one's around to take the scroll. No one was found worthy enough to open the scroll. In fact, actually where it says no one, the word actually in King James has no man. In other words, it had to be a descent of man that was going to be able to have worthiness to open this scroll. The result was, in verse 4, that John wept greatly. He's crying because there isn't anyone found to open it. Now, John must have known something that we probably didn't know that caused him to break down and weep greatly, it says, unconvulsively cry. And you start thinking, what is it that, that, that John knew that would, I mean, if somebody held a scroll and who can open it, no one would go, oh, okay, you know, no one's able to open, open the scroll, big deal. But if you know what that scroll represented or what you think it represents and no one's there, obviously there's going to be some huge emotion involved. There are two views on what the scroll represents. And I'll share both views. When you're done as a student, you can feel what view you want. You might say at the end, Brad, what do you have? I might share. I not, may not. But it's important to understand that there are great men of all God that believe in both views. Both of them believe that, either view, believe that this scroll represents the fate of the world. Whatever it is, the fate of the world is at hand. We know that we're in heaven we know that there's a period of time that's going to be taking place shortly afterwards. In fact, the number of years is seven years that's going to take place. 
after with the study that we talk on next week of worship, the following week before we hit chapter 6, we're going to hit, I think, the most, one of the most important passages dealing with eschatology, which is end times in the Bible, and that's in Daniel chapter 7. Verses 24, 25, 26, 27. We have to understand Daniel chapter 7 and that portion for us to really understand the book of Revelation in chapter 6 on. So that's going to be in two weeks from now. Don't miss that. If you're gone, be sure you watch that because that's going to be huge. But one perspective is this. Barclay says that the scroll is God's will, his final settlement in the affairs of the universe. He believes this because the Roman under Roman law, that if you had a will, a testament that you were going to give, this is my testament I'm going to leave to my kids, this and that, that would be written on a scroll and it would be sealed up and it would be sealed with seven seals. So Barclay believes that this was God's testament, God's will. A will is a legal document that lets you tell the world who should receive what after you die, right? That's a will. That's what you have. I leave to my brother this. I leave to my sister this. I leave to Aunt Gertrude this. Whatever it's going to be. The Roman law actually required that it be sealed and Augustus and Vespasian, Vespasian, two emperors, actually had a will with seven seals on it. There are many people that believe that this is a book where the God's purposes and his designs for the end of the world, for the governments of the world, for what he wills to happen in the last days is what this scroll represents. Woodward actually says the sealed book is a comprehensive program of God culminating in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Matthew Poole says the book is of counsels and decrees and purposes of God relating to his church. So here's the first thought. The first thought that what many people that I just read to you believe is this. The scroll is God's testament. Is God's will. It's his predetermined will. It's his complete will where the history of the world is already written. In other words, God knows what's going to happen. In the breaking and the opening of the scroll, he's going to initiate his purposes and his designs in the affairs of the government, in the affairs of the church that's going to continue to the second coming of Jesus Christ. So that's what the opening of the scroll would be. God's predetermined will. God knows all. He knows what's going to happen. And so in opening the scrolls, God's will or his purposes or his designs will then be revealed and implemented. Okay? Calvary Chapel pastors believe this. A lot of great people believe this perspective. This could be exactly what it is. God's will, his predetermined will that he wrote, like you would write a will out, right? But it's for the last seven years of what's going to be happening culminating. However, there's a second thought of which Chuck Smith and other Calvary Chapel pastors hold to. So it's not like one is in one way. One is, sometimes they say, brother, well, just tell us the truth. I don't know if I know the truth because nobody tells us what the scroll is, right? I like when we read that one verse, they hold these bowls and the bowls are the prayers of the saints. Well, now we know what's in the bowls. We don't have to guess this. But I think it is important to look at scripture and to see what, what it really could be because that really is pretty powerful. The second thought is this, that the scroll is indeed the title deed to the earth. Hmm, what do you mean the title deed to the earth? Well, a title deed is a legal document that gives you the right of ownership to your property, right? Those of you that own property, really the bank owns it till it's all wet, paid off, and then you get the title deed to your property with no liens on it, Correct. You have total ownership. Nobody can come across. You own that. So this could be the title deed to the earth. In the Old Testament, title deeds were written on scrolls, and they were also sealed with seven seals. On the inside or the front, when you open it, it would list the assets. It would list a property title. It would list all the different things that you need in any title. However, when they rolled it up and sealed it, Many times the instructions and who could open it were written on the outside of the scroll. Sometimes it was written in a second document that wasn't sealed. So some people believe this could be a title deed to the earth. Very interesting. Under Jewish law, whenever you sold a piece of property, let's say I sold, I sold uh, uh, Paul a piece of property, 
It was in my family. It's always been in my family, but I sold it to him. I would then be able to have what's called a redemptive clause that I would be able to write that would give me a certain period of time since I was the owner. If I met the specific parts in this redemptive clause, I could come back and say, hey, Paul, I want to redeem the property, this deed, back to me. And you say, well, do you have the authority? Yes, I was the original owner. Well, do you have the finances? Yes. Are you willing to do it? Yes. Okay, then go ahead. That would be written on the outside. Or it could be in another document that was unsealed. Let me see, are you the owner? Yes, yes, yes. Great. And then I could open the seals, and in doing so, I would take possession of what? My property, the title that would come apart. <clears throat> And so I think that was pretty cool. That was always going to be able to be done. And there's always those three cri criterias. However, if we find out that the time of redemption, I was not able to redeem the property, I didn't have to do it, it is possible that I could have a family member of my blood relationship redeem the property for me. In other words, I could have a kinsman of mine what? Redeem the property. Thus the term kinsman redeemer. I want to really slow down to make sure you understand that. Because you may have heard, you know, that, gee whiz, wasn't there a kinsman redeemer in the book of Ruth? Yeah. Wasn't there? Is God our, I heard Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. What does that mean? I want, that's what I want to make sure you understand today. So if I couldn't redeem the property, maybe someone in my family, maybe my son Matthew, he might come up and say, hold on, I have the ability to actually redeem it. So if we look at the slide that talks about kinsman redeemer, pop that up there, the law allowed that if the original owner was not able to fulfill the requirements of the redemptive clause, like if I couldn't get the possession back, but I had a relative or a kinsman or a blood descent that was able and willing to fulfill the requirements of the clause, that person had the authority to redeem the property. They could take the scroll, break it, read the words, and redeem it back for me, the original owner. Does that make sense? That's what they could actually do. So there's always these criteria. And the criteria was with the next slide. Can I see the next slide there? They had to be a blood relative to the owner. They had to be able, they had the financial ability to take care and uh, pay the original price or whatever it had to be paid to redeem the property. They had to do it within a specific period of time, and they had to be willing. I mean, I might be a kinsman, but I have no desire to put my resources out, right, so that you would get the property back under my ownership. That's really not my desire to happen to you. There's a couple great examples. One of the most well-known examples in the story of the, of the book of Ruth. We know Naomi, all her husband was dead and her children was dead, and she had a problem because she had some land, and if not, it would be lost. And so Boaz was a kinsman, was a relative, and actually took and purchased and redeemed the lamb on behalf of Naomi. Also took in marriage Ruth which is another part of the law, which I'm not going to get into. But in doing so, their first child inherited the law and the land under Naomi. Pretty powerful to understand that because uh, Obed was the name of their first child of which the line of David continued. Another part of the story. But there's another story that gives us a little more information that you probably haven't heard about and it had to do with Jeremiah. Jeremiah was that prophet that prophesied to the southern nation, the southern kingdom of Judah, that Babylon was going to come and destroy them. He was a pretty interesting prophet. He kept telling them, they're going to come, and you're going to be in captivity for 70 years. Go willingly. Don't argue. If you argue, you're going to commit suicide. So go pack your bags and go in peace and head on down to Babylon or else they're going to come and destroy you. Because he had this message, the king thought he was committing treason and aligning himself up with the Babylonians. So they took Jeremiah 
and they actually put him in prison. Jeremiah was just telling these people what God told them to say to them, because God was going to have judgment now upon the nation of Israel, excuse me, Judah, the, the southern portion, and they were going to go into captivity for 70 years. That's what God's going to do. Don't fight it. You're going to die. And so the story <clears throat> continues, and it brings in Jeremiah 32. And it says, And Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Behold, Hanamel, the son of Shalom, your uncle, will come to you, saying, Buy my field, which is Anathoth, for the right of redemption is yours to buy it. So here we see this right of redemption. We see that, that the word, God is telling Jeremiah, hey, your uncle's property is coming up for redemption. I want you to do something. I want you to purchase the property. Use your money. Use your resources. I want you to be willing. Now here's the, here's the, the crux that God was telling him is this. As you buy this property, as people are going to captivity, you're telling everybody that after 70 years, what? You're going to come back, and the property's still going to be there. So it was a word of encouragement that he's telling these people, look, at, I'm going to invest back into property in, in Jerusalem. I think it's a good investment because we're coming back. We need to get ready to go away, but we're going to be gone for 70 years. We're going to be coming back. So that was the main message in this. But Jeremiah had an opportunity to be a kinsman redeemer to purchase this title deed back for his uncle. So verse 9, So I bought the field from Hanamel, the son of my uncle, who was an Anathoth, and went out to him the money, 17 shekels of silver. And I signed the deed and sealed it, took witnesses, weighed the money and the scales. I also took the purchase deed, both that which was sealed according to the law and customs, and look at this, and that which was what? Open. So one was what? Sealed. But there was another deed, another clause, which was a redemptive clause that would be left open. And I gave the purchase deed to Baruch, the son of Neriah, the son of Masiah, in the presence of Hanamel, my uncle's son, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the purchase deed before all the Jews who sat before the uh, court of the prison. He's in prison when he does this. Then I charged Baruch before them, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God, the host of gods of Israel, take these deeds, both the purchase deed, which was what? Sealed, and the one that was open, and put them in the earthen vessel that they may last many days, specifically more than 70 years. No moisture needs to get into this paper, right? Because when you come back, years later, they're going to take this jar, they're going to open up the scrolls, and if one can comply with this open deed, then they could then what? Take off the seals and redeem it and redeem it. So now let's get back to the book of Revelation. But I want you to understand why the deeds could be the possibility, not just a testament or a will. We see in God the Father's hand a seal with seven seals. And many people believe that this is the title deed to the earth. See, originally the earth belonged to God. It was the creations of God. Psalms 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof and all that dwell therein. In other words, God created and it was his earth. However, when God created man, he gave man the earth. He said to Adam in Genesis 1, 26, Have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air, over every moving and living creature, for I have given it to thee. It is yours. So he gave earth to man. However, man turned the earth that God gave him over to Satan when he disobeyed God and he obeyed the suggestions of Satan. He forfeited the earth and gave it to Satan and it became Satan. We know that Satan, as it says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, is the God of the world. We understand that. We've read about that. And it was pretty clear that the first time that's just that um, Jesus was ever tempted, he was brought out into the wilderness, and he tempted. And, and the second temptation after he tempted to turn the stone into bread was this. In Luke 4, verse 5, Then the devil, taking him to a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil, devil said to him, All authority I will give to you in their glory for this has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whomever I wish. Wow, that's quite a statement. 
quite a statement that Satan says, I have the authority over this world and I can give it to you, Jesus, if you just what? Bow down and what? Worship me. And Jesus didn't do that, of course. So here we see that, that Satan's boasting, the whole world is mine. I have the capacity to give it to whomever I will. The world is under the control of, of power of Satan. So as we look at the scroll as a title deed, here's thought number two. The scroll is a title deed to the earth. Originally it belonged uh, to God by creation. By God he gave it to man. Adam turned the earth over to Satan. So we need to have, if the earth is to be redeemed back to God, we need to have a kinsman redeemer come forth that meets all the requirements of a redemptive clause to redeem the earth. That's the dilemma that we're in. Which takes us back. The strong angel that says in chapter in verse 2 and 3, I saw a strong angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose the seals? And no one in heaven and earth was able to do so. There was no one worthy. There was no man worthy as he looked around to come and to take the scroll of his a title deed who had the authority of the redemptive clause to open it. There had to be someone that met all the criteria to do that. No one was worthy and had the capacity to redeem it. If no one could redeem the title deed to the earth, that means the earth will forever remain under the control of who? Satan. That's worth weeping about. That's worth crying about. And I believe that's what John was weeping about. If someone wasn't found worthy, in, in, then, then who's going to open the seals and take possession back? So he cries. See, there's only a certain amount of time, an appointed amount of time, in which this earth could be redeemed. And if it's not going to be redeemed, then it's going to be lost forever, perpetually. You only have one chance to redeem it. And just in the midst of the possible tragedy that could happen, something changes. Verse 5 says, but one of the elders, that would be the 24 elders representing the church, he said to John, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose the seven seals. The whole scene changes. It's like you're looking at this movie and you're crying and what's going to happen and bam, bam. Don't worry. What? Someone has prevailed. Somebody is worthy enough to come forth and to take the seal, take the scroll, open the seals, and to read it. Who is it? It's a lion. But not just any lion. It's not the wizard of law's lion. It's the lion of the tribe of Judah. We saw last week, as we looked at all the different tribes that, 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 are, are, that surrounded, that the tribe of Judah had what as a symbol? The lion, we saw that. Jesus here is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. In Genesis 49, 1 and 2, it says, And Jacob, Jacob, um, which is the son of Isaac, um, uh, which is the son of Abraham, he's also called Israel. He had his 12 sons come around him, which are the 12 tribes of Israel. And he was going to put a blessing on each one of his children. And so he, he blessed the first three, and then he had the fourth one come up, which was Judah. And it says, well, it says here, verse 1 and 2, And Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together, and I will tell you, may tell you what's going to befall on you in the last days. Gather together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. He continues in verse 8, and he gives a blessing to Judah. And this is the blessing he gave to Judah. Judah, you are he whom your brother shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down, he lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? Look at verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh, which is the only reference, this word at time is used, refers to the Messiah. Shiloh is only used one time, comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. You see, the line of the tribe of Judah is Jesus Christ. He is the one that's going to come down from the lineage of Judah, all the way down from David, all the way down until he is born. It says here also the root of David. We saw before we talked about this, the root of David in 11, one of, uh, chapter of the book of Isaiah. It says, there shall come forth a root from the stem of Jesse. Jesse's son was David. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. 
Also in Matthew 1.1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of who? The son of David, the son of Abraham. He's going to prevail. How does he prevail? He's already won. He's prevailed. See, Christ prevailed at the cross. He died for your sins. He died for our sins. The sin debt was settled forever, for all time. He defeated Satan at the cross. However, we see that in the midst of all this, John's hearing about this lion, but then something happens incredibly in verse 6. He looks, and behold, in the middle of the throne, the four living creatures, in the middle of the elders, stood a lamb. He's looking for a lamb, but he sees a what? A lamb. A lamb as though he had been slain. Like there's blood on this lamb. He has seven horns and seven heads, which are the seven spirits of God sent out of all the earth. Then he came and looked in the scroll, out of, and he took the scroll out of his right hand, who sat on the throne. Now that looks pretty interesting, doesn't it? A seven-horned and a seven-eyed lamb that slain. That is the one that's standing in front of the four living creatures, in front of the 24 elders, reaching up and taking hold of the scroll. This lamb is worthy. He has prevailed. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. As John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away what? The sins of the world. It says it has been slain. It's kind of interesting. I think we think of what are we going to see when we go to heaven? Are we going to see this Anglo-looking Jesus Christ that we have the pictures of? Or are we going to see a Lamb of God that's like was freshly slain for us? The seven horns represent complete power, omnipotence. The seven eyes represent complete what? Knowledge, omniscience. Jesus Christ has total power. Jesus Christ is totally omniscient. He sees all these things. He knows what's happening. And we see that John now sees this lamb has been slaughtered, still being slaughtered, bearing the marks of the cross still upon him, and he takes the scroll from him. This means that in order for him to be able to take the scroll, he had to be able to fulfill the four criteria of the redemptive clause. Does that make sense? He had to have. Jesus Christ, the Lion of Judah, and the Lamb of God that was sacrificed for our sins is our kinsman redeemer. Excuse me. As the kinsman redeemer has met all the requirements for redeeming the title deed for the earth and to break the scroll. How is that possible? Well, Jesus Christ was the blood relative of Adam who actually became the owner. He was not just a man. He was the perfect man. He was a sinless man. He did have the blood of Adam in him. Two, he was able to pay the total price for redemption. That was the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. That was the price for redemption, to redeem it, to defeat Satan. Three, he's doing it within the specific period of time. And the time is coming to a close, guys. And he is up there and is going to be redeeming it. And he is willing to do it, the fourth criteria. Praise God that Jesus Christ was willing to come down, right, and die for your sins and die for my sins. And so when we look at this, we realize that, you know, whenever you read about redemption in the New Testament, it's always connected with the blood of Jesus Christ every single time. And not only did Christ come to redeem us from our sins, and I, I was, I, you know, the, the song we sang this morning, I started writing down the words. I, I read these songs and I just, worthy is the lamb that was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. I mean, this is the, this is the God, this is Jesus Christ we're singing about. He's worthy. He was the one who, if he didn't take the scroll out of the Father's hand, we'd be, the world would be lost. Now, guys, an interesting thought. When you pray the Lord's Prayer, he says, pray in this manner. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy what? Thy will be done. Where? As it is in heaven. You prayed, God's kingdom come. Where? On earth. You realize that you're praying for God's millennial kingdom. You're praying for his kingdom to come on earth. The only way that the kingdom could ever come on earth, the millennial kingdom, is if God, again, had possession of the earth, which was made possible as Jesus Christ as the kinsman redeemer. It wouldn't be possible at all, but it's all part of God's plan to happen. And I think about that, and, I, I, you know, I look, at, I look at John just crying and, and then i think wow 
Do I just take this for granted? Do I just take for granted all that Jesus Christ has done for me? And not realize, I mean, this, his personal cost, what it costs God to come down the form of a man, to humble himself, to die on a cross for you and I, to take your sins and my sins upon him, that we then can be free from the power of sin, from the guilt of sin, from, from the consequences of sin. And we just say that so flippantly. We have the eternal Holy Spirit living in our lives to live powerfully for God. May that move you this morning. May it touch you this morning. May it touch me in a brand new way. May, the, may this whole new apocalypse of who Jesus Christ is be afresh to you as a lion of the tribe of Judah and as a lamb slain. Only he is worthy. I'm going to close with this scripture. In the Peter 1, 18, 19, it says, We are redeemed, not with corruptible things like silver and gold from our empty manner of living. How are we redeemed? We're redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ who was slain as a lamb without spot and without blemish. You know what happens in heaven once that occurs? They break out in total worship and praise because they catch it. They realize it. May we realize it this morning. Let's pray. Lord, I pray, first of all, God, if there's anybody here who hasn't received you as their Lord and Savior, who wants to, who have forgiveness of their sins from their guilt of their sins, Lord, and have the Holy Spirit empower them to give them power over the sins. If you'd like to ask Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior this morning, look up. Is there anyone here this morning? If there's anyone here that's going through some stuff, difficult things, some trials or some health, and you just, as we talked about, want your feet washed, you want us to pray for you this week, look up. Is there anyone here this morning? Thank you, way back there, sis. Thank you, brother. Thank you, both of you here. Thank you. Thank you, sis. Thank you, there. Thanks. Thank you, guys, there. Thank you, bro. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just come to you, Lord. We thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you, God, that you care about each one of us, Lord. That if we would have been the only person on this world, you would have came and died for us, Lord. That's how precious we are in your sight. God, we pray, Lord, that you would just work in your power. Help us with the trials that we need, the difficulties, the wisdom, with the health issues, Lord. We put this before you, Father. We thank you that you are a God who cares. Lord, and we come to you and we put this before your feet. Lord, hear our prayers. Answer our prayers, God. Speak to us. Fill us with your spirit. Give us the power to endure, to grow through whatever we're going through. May we see you freshly. In Jesus' name. And they all said...